I think we're ready to go. Slide in. So, okay. I try to so. Right. All right, my friends, I think we're going to get going here. It's 7 p.m. on the dot. This, that's that's on. open. Yep. Okay. Watch out for this. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, talk tonight. Just wanted to let you know that on the 9th of October, our next gathering, Herb Wilson, who is Professor Emeritus from Colby College, will be speaking on vagrant birds seen in Maine. And I guess there's actually quite a number, more than what we hear about that make the big paper news. And then on the 13th, we have uh, two researchers from UMF, Rachel Hovell and Julia Daly, talking about a program they're doing right now, monitoring high lakes in, I think, in Maine. We were actually out hiking last Sunday up to Cranberry Pond on Bigelow. And there we ran into their informational sign, and I was pretty excited. Um, they're looking at temperature, freezing, movement of the water, all sorts of things. So I think that's going to be very interesting as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Nick. Yep. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hi. Hi. I can introduce, I can uh, uh, address everyone individually in the crowd. It's great. Um, I'm Nick Lund. I work for Maine Audubon. I am our advocacy and outreach manager. Uh, I am proud to work for Maine Audubon and work in our advocacy department. And I'm proud to talk to you all about what we've been up to over the past year. Um, this is an easygoing crowd. So if you have questions, just shout it out at any time. We'll just do it that way. And then I'll save time for questions uh, at the end, or I can just start talking about vagrant birds too. It actually sounds kind of more fun to me. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, I'm proud to pre present this. Uh, our advocacy team is very small, and my colleague, uh, Francesca Chess Gundrum, um, is actually the one who led most of this work that I'll be talking about. Um, I play uh, a, a crucial role and an important role on this, but Chess is the one doing most of our legislative advocacy. She's our advocacy director, and she is doing so. She's lobbying the vast majority of the time doing the hardcore work. And so uh, I'm happy to re uh, represent her today. And if you, if you have tough questions, I may just have her follow up with you later on, but we'll see. So let's, here we go. Um, so what do we do? Maine Audubon. So I, I don't need to tell you who we are, maybe. Um, I'm proud to be here for the Western Maine chapter, one of our A7 chapters across the state. Um, Maine Audubon is the uh, oldest and largest wildlife conservation organization in the state of Maine. We've been around since 1843. Um, and we are renowned around the state as advocates on behalf of uh, birds and wildlife. Um, we are, have sort of three legs of our stool. Well, have four legs of our stool. I don't know why it's a stool. It's not really a good metaphor. Anything that has four legs uh, is sort of a good metaphor for us. Uh, advocacy being one of the legs. Um, conservation being another one. We have biologists on staff who are out there monitoring populations of wildlife in Maine and figuring out what's going on with them. Uh, we have our um, education team. So thousand, we teach thousands of kids and adults around the state what's going on with Maine wildlife, why they should love it and protect it. And then I would say our properties team is our fourth. Uh, we uh, own um, eight sanctuaries around the state of Maine that are free and open to the public to visit. The closest up here is probably um, 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 Borestone Mountain up near Monson. The rest are sort of down near the coast or Fields Pond in, in Brewer. 
Uh, we're a great organization and we do a lot of advocacy um, despite having a small team. Um, we do advocacy on several different levels. We do the local level. This is me in Gilsland Farm, our Gilsland Farm headquarters in Falmouth, talking about some of the bird glass collision work that I do. I will be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, did get a haircut since then. Um, we do a lot of state level advocacy. Um, and this is where the vast majority of our advocacy effort is spent and Chess's time is uh, uh, testifying, you know, pushing bills in front of Congress or trying to stop bills in front of the legislature in Augusta. Um, this is, you know, pictures that Chess took uh, during some of the countless hours she spent in various committee rooms um, waiting to testify or testifying or, or, or observing the procedures. That's Chess there testifying and taking some questions from some, from some legislators. We also work at the federal level. And actually, um, one of the things we, we hope to do uh, more in the future is uh, uh, beef up our federal advocacy. Um, this is um, Chess in the front and then some of our other main Audubon partners in the back including Doug Hitchcock in one of his rare suited appearances. Um, he hates it when we say that. Anybody know Doug Hitchcock? Beloved guy, um, uh, you know, found often in, you know, muck boots and uh, dirty clothes. Um, he doesn't, he, he sort of uh, doesn't like it when we point out that he's wearing a suit right here, but it is pretty weird to see him in a suit. Anyway, they were down in DC to help advocate on behalf of the Endangered Species Act. Um, so uh, we work at all uh, different levels of government um, and are proud to do it. Um, the sort of foundations to our advocacy is that we are science-based and measured and inclusive. So we um, make sure that all the positions that we take are based in science, especially the science that our conservation team tells us, right? Um, so we really want to make sure that our positions are well-founded and have the best interests of wildlife in mind. Uh, we rely a lot on citizen advocates, so um, it really helps, we'll talk about this a little bit later, it really helps when um, uh, constituents of particular legislators reach out and say, here's what I want, here's what you should vote. Um, that's sort of an underratedly powerful thing, um, especially in Maine, where um, certain le legislators on committees may never hear from their constituents on any particular issue. And so if you can reach out and, and say something, it goes a long way. Um, we have some general focus areas. This is sort of broad, um, but it's important to, you know, think about all the different issue areas that, that can pop up. Um, climate change, renewable energy, forest habitat stewardship, connectivity, land for Maine's future. That's a uh, land conservation um, program in Maine. The North Woods, plastic pollution, clean water, rare, threatened, and endangered species. These are all issues that when we get ready for the session, we are tracking bills uh, that either are for, you know, may help or harm these issue areas. So it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but thankfully, we have a lot of help. Um, we work a lot in coalition. So when I'm at my desk uh, at home all day, I'm usually on calls with different groups of other uh, groups in Maine who work on particular issues. Um, Maine is blessed with a really sort of powerful nonprofit environmental network. We have a lot of folks in here who, who care about the environment, and we organize ourselves really, really well. Uh, we're really a, a model for other states in terms of environmental activism and organization. Um, the, the main one there is you see the Environmental Priorities Coalition there. Um, that is a, a sort of strategy that was what developed in Maine to get all these environmental groups together to try to pull in the same direction. Um, a lot of other states you can go to, um, there is an organization between the different groups and they may not agree. They may introduce a bill that says, you know, uh, you know, we should cap pollution at seven parts. And then the, another group submits legislation and say, we had to cap it at 10 parts. And then they fight over that. The Environmental Priorities Coalition is about 20 plus years old. It's a, it's a large group of 50 or so organizations in Maine that come together and talk about their, the bills that they wanna see. Um, and then work as a unified front to propose bills and get them passed. Um, it's a really effective group. And we see time and time again, when we talk to legislators in Augusta, they say, is this an EPC priority bill? If so, I gotta, you know, I'm dead if I don't uh, vote for it. So um, working together uh, has really uh, improved the efficiency of our advocacy in Maine. 
Here's some of our other groups there. These are just a smattering of one that like have logos. Um, there's others out there that uh, that we work with. Um, so um, I, I want to talk about what we did last year, just cruise through last year. Um, the legislative session in Maine is broken into two parts, first session and the second session. Um, the It goes year by year. So the first session of the um, 131st legislature was in 2023. The second session was in 2024. Um, the first session is generally more active. That's when there's new people in the legislature, there's new ideas there. And so there's generally more done in the first session of a, of a legislature than the second. And uh, we kicked some butt, I will say, in that first session. We did a lot. Um, what's all up there? Okay, let me see how this works. So, um, so one of our uh, most important bills that we passed during the first session was uh, to help protect loons. Um, Maine Audubon, since the early 80s, has had uh, a loon a protection program. Um, we started back then just being like, uh, you know, we know everybody loves loons, but we don't know how they're doing. Are their populations going up or down? Um, and so we have this we have this gigantic citizen science program to get loon counters out on the lakes every summer to count all the loons they can. To, and so then we can get all that data to see, are they going up? Are they going down? Where? Things like that. Uh, we also work with Tufts Veterinary School to identify the causes of loon mortality. They do necropsies on loons, and they can tell us what happened, how did this loon die. One of the biggest causes we found for loon mortality was lead poisoning. Um, lead was lead sinkers and jigs were falling off fishing tackle. Loons, so quick aside, loons swallow their fish whole. They don't have hands. They can't use forks and knives, right? So when they, you've probably seen that when they catch fish, they swallow the whole thing whole. To, to chew, they swallow stones from the, the bottom of the lake and those go into their gizzard. And so when they eat a fish, it also goes into the gizzard and then they squeeze the gizzard and it chews the food for them. Um, that's how loons and a lot of other diving birds eat. The trouble is loons were diving to the bottom and collecting what they thought were stones, but were really lead sinkers, discarded lead tackle. So they'd get this lead in their body and then they would get lead poisoning, just like you know, a human would. So that's a real problem. And that was the leading cause of loon mortality in Maine since the early eighties. So we took action. Um, we worked uh, probably five years ago now to pass a bill that worked to ban the sale of bare lead tackle. Um, we were very proud of that. But there was a loophole in that bill, as what happens is the fishing industry was very much against this, um, that said that painted tackle was okay. So, uh, it, you know, if it's get painted like a little fish or whatever, trouble is that the paint doesn't do anything to make it safer at all. So those, those uh, jigs and sinkers were just as dangerous. So this past year, uh, last year in 2023, the first session, we closed that loophole up. We did it, it was great. So um, we were phasing out the sale of painted lead jigs and um, uh, have in parallel a robust program to buy back lead tackle from fishermen uh, and to uh, set up exchanges at different tackle fishing stores. So a great program for us and we're really proud. This is, this is Chess uh, with the governor signing that bill um, in Congress or in the legislature. Um, one of the things we do is monitor populations of endangered species and recommend them for addition to the State Endangered Species Act. So there's the Federal Endangered Species Act and then state level Endangered Species Act. Um, we advocated on behalf of eight species to join the list uh, this past year, um, including the salt marsh sparrow there down that bird. That bird lives on, in uh, coastal marshes along the, uh, along the coast, obviously, um, which are experiencing habitat loss, um, uh, uh, habitat degradation and sea level rise. Um, so uh, that bird and, and others, oh man, now I got to remember the other eight that were added, the other seven that were added. Um, there was bank swallow and cliff swallow and um, bicknell thrush and um, black pole warbler and a certain species of tiger beetle and a certain bumblebee and a mystery one that we'll all find out later. <laughs> And I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but we were very proud to do that. That takes a lot of negotiation with uh, folks who are concerned about what that would mean. 
being on the endangered species list in Maine means that there's more, more consideration given when an activity takes place in your habitat, which is very important as um, you know, Maine continues to grow. We now, as of 2023, have a state butterfly. Anybody know what it is? It's a picture of it. Can you tell? Pink edge sulfur. Nice job. Did you know that from the story or can you can tell what it is? Hey, all right. Pink edge sulfur. So this is one, um, uh, a bunch of school kids in Kennebunk um, came up with this idea and they said, you know, we don't have a state butterfly. We'd like to have one. Um, they originally chose uh, a, a butterfly called Hessel's hair streak, which is endangered. And so we sort of work with the state to say, butterfly people are very nervous about butterflies <laughs> because people go out and capture them. And so they thought that bringing more attention to Hessel's hair streak would actually be a detriment to the populations. And so we work with the students to come up with option B and they chose pink edge sulfur. And here we are, it's very cool. Um, we, we helped uh, Chess brought all these kids to testify in Augusta. Uh, and then when the bill was eventually passed, they brought them to, um, to sign the, um, uh, this is them in the committee room, but them to sign the bill with the governor. Uh, very cool. And then I took them on some walks to Kennebunk Plains down south to find the butterfly. We didn't find it. Sorry, I tried my best. Uh, but the kids were really proud to sort of uh, have that experience and, and we're proud to have a state butterfly now. Um, this is one that I am most proud of for myself personally. Um, I run a program called Bird Safe Maine, which works to educate about bird glass collisions. Um, it's so seemingly a sort of niche issue and one that's easily overlooked, but it kills over 1 billion birds every year in the United States. It's a major killer of birds. Um, and it's one that a lot of people and municipalities, everybody's just sort of waking up to the scale of it and how to respond. Um, one of the ways to respond is to develop guidelines for the, for the state, and that's what we did. So um, this, we uh, worked with uh, the legislature to pass a bill um, to develop guidelines that the state will use as part of their buildings to make them bird safe. Um, we were thrilled to pass this. Maine is now just one of four states in the nation that has taken statewide action uh, on bird safe buildings. And um, this just sort of came about ser serendipitously and we were pleased to pass it. It's still an issue. Uh, Bert and I found a dead bird about five minutes ago uh, by the library on our way in here. Um, and so there is certainly work to be done, um, but um, we we're optimistic for the future. So right now in my spare time, I'm writing these guidelines um, for the state as, uh, as asked for, of me under this law. Uh, is that? Uh, okay, the last one there, I guess there's no picture for. Um, LD649 was a bill to uh, allow folks to plant native plants. So native plants are one of Maine Audubon's big initiatives. We know that um, uh, planting native plants is much better for areas birds because they have the food that birds need. Um, so we grow native plants, we sell native plants, we advocate on behalf of native plants wherever we can. Um, some homeowners associations, for example, don't sometimes don't want you to grow weird stuff in your lawn. Um, I don't live in a place with a homeowner. I can't imagine how stressful that would be or annoying. Um, but some homeowners associations say, no, you got to have grass and you got to cut it, you know, uh, X. Um, but some people want to say, no, I want to uh, pursue native plantings. And so uh, following the lead from a bill that was passed in Maryland um, in 2022, Maine passed a bill uh, which allows landowners to plant native plants no matter what their HOA says uh, and other things. So um, pretty cool to get the state to stand up on behalf of native, uh, native plants and we're proud to pass that one. Um, in the second, so now I wanna move to the second session. This is uh, the one that just concluded a couple months ago. Um, we were working hard. Um, Maine Audubon and mostly Chess um, testified on 23 different individual bills um, and then 80 individual bills in the, the first and second session combined. Um, that is a lot, that's a lot of work. That means working with partners to understand the bill, understand our position on it, draft testimony, uh, find uh, people to give the testimony if it's not Chess herself. We, you know, we, we prefer to have uh, wherever we can, someone, someone else to, to testify. Um, and then getting all that stuff together giving the testimony, making sure everything's submitted. It's a lot of work. 
Um, you can see there, I mentioned that the first session is generally more busier. And so the second session was, was mostly, uh, was a little bit, a little bit easier on them. Um, we had tons and tons of help from our members, 1900 messages sent to legislators uh, across the state. And that number is not as big as it could be uh, by design. Um, we have software that allows us to take our membership and um, to understand where people live in for their for their uh, congressperson or for their okay let me just restart that again so the first step of a bill is that it's in oh and i'm i'm missing some slides on here interesting um i, I had a slide in here that talked about um oh now i'm nervous um that talked about how a bill gets passed in maine um, the most important step is that it goes to a committee. So once a bill is written, it goes to a specific committee of the legislature. The legislature is broken up into these issue area committees. We work most often with um, uh, environment and natural resources um, and other related environmental ones. So when a bill goes to the committee, they it's a smaller group of legislatures, legislators. They hear the testimony and they make a recommendation to the larger um, legislator about whether it should pass or not. Right. So getting getting a bill to pass committee is a big deal. And so um, most of our work is focused in committees. And so we have software when we want to encourage a, uh, a committee to vote the right way to send messages just from their constituents to them. Right. The way that legislators work is that if they're the, if they represent Farmington, they don't want to hear from someone in Belfast. Doesn't doesn't matter to them. So we can isolate the people from. Farmington, for example, and ask them to say, hey, would you send a message to your um, representative asking them to vote yes or no on this bill? And that way they only hear from people in their districts. Um, that's really important and really sort of advanced software. Um, and it also means that, well, uh, so it means two things. One, it means that when we send out messages, we're not sending it to the entire state. So we're not asking everybody to take every action. It also means that if you are one of the people who get these messages, please, it makes a huge outsized difference if you click yes on that. Um, because uh, this, con this representative may only hear from one or two people um, because we just don't have the biggest list or because whatever. Um, and so if you are one of the lucky people to get these messages, it, it, it makes a huge difference because not many people are actually hearing that thing. Um, we do petitions too. We had a big aquatic invasive species petition, one of our largest ever. All right, so coming into some of the pros and cons of the past uh, session, um, the red means a bill that we didn't want to pass and didn't, and didn't pass, and the green means wanted to pass and did pass. Um, a lot of this past session was focused on housing issues. Um, issues of uh, the price of housing were, were a big deal, and so there was a big movement at the beginning of the session for legislators to, to put in bills about how to make it easier to build houses, et cetera. Um, it's a tricky issue for us. We, we want to um, facilitate more housing, but we don't want it to be, we want it to be done smartly, right? We don't want sprawl, you know, lots of habitat to be taken up by sprawl or uh, developments to be, to be done in, in ways that are too easy. And so what a lot of what some of these bills do is they say, you know, let's just wipe away some of these environmental review requirements or let's make it easier to build a lot more houses quickly without adequate review. That's not what we want. Right. Um, and so uh, a bill like LD 1134 uh, was was going to propose that was going to do that. It would have changed this certain definition of what a subdivision is to uh, make it so um, you could basically build more houses without triggering environmental review. We didn't want that, our partners didn't want that, and we opposed it and it didn't pass. So that's good. Um, but we do wanna make sure that we, we are very conscious of the fact that we do wanna grow and we wanna facilitate it in the right way. Uh, and so we do, uh, we promote what's called smart growth, which is just basically advanced planning um, where you can identify areas of high value habitat and avoid them as you as you work to grow. That way developers know the areas that will be a little easier for them and won't cause the conflict. And so um, this bill LD uh, 1673 um, gets that process started. We're starting with a, a working group um, to start to figure out how to best promote some of these tactics. Recommendations that come out of that group will then come back to the legislature and hopefully we can pass those to make things better. That's a duplicate slide. So is that. 
So is that? Uh oh. All right. Um, lakes were a big issue in the second session. Um, you all know, I'm sure, about the problems of aquatic invasive species all around Maine. Um, it's uh, it's a big deal. Uh, these are uh, plants that are introduced from elsewhere that once they get into main lakes can proliferate and cause all kinds of problems for water quality, for native species, for, you know, angling and things. Um, and so Maine has a really robust network of volunteers and some staff to check boats and educate folks about how to keep invasive species out of the waters. Um, but it takes work and it takes increasing amount of work and funds um, to make sure that we're stopping new threats and addressing uh, existing infestations. And so we had a couple bills that uh, worked on lakes. Um, one was we um, worked a lot to increase a sticker fee for a specific um, sticker that goes on everybody's boat um, that the funds go to aquatic invasive species uh, um, restoration programs. Um, we did a lot, chested a lot of in the trenches work to figure out how that fee would go up. We're of course, you know, sensitive to not making people pay more. Um, but we um, did work to make sure that that was uh, something that we could all get, agree on. And we're proud of that bill. Uh, I think it went up $8 for the next couple of years and then may go up in the future. Um, another thing about Maine lakes is shoreland zoning rules. So anybody like live on a lake here? You've been on a lake, you know lakes? You know, there are rules in Maine. You can't, if you own property along the lake, you can't just shear the trees down and have uh you know stuff to the water uh oh did you know that oh. oh you made it look like you're like oh you can't oh no i just yeah interesting well there are more unscrupulous people, some developers, and there are some famous cases at some lakes in Southern Maine, will buy a property, come in, cut everything down, and then sell the property. Um, they may get uh, fines from the town, but they uh, just either absorb them as cost of doing business, the profit they make from selling the land is much greater, um, and otherwise sort of take advantage of the system. And what it results in is, uh, Everybody is mad, basically. You know, the, everyone else on the lake who is respecting these laws and and you know not having the perfect view they can't resents this guy now for cutting down the trees. And also, the water quality and the the attendant issues. The reason we have these rules don't work. And so um, we were approached by um, a representative who had a lake where this was a real issue, and we what we did was propose some bills to uh, address this to give towns. Um, more teeth to address this type of situation. Um, they are, uh, because of this law, now able to attach liens on properties. So a developer can't just leave uh, and make it someone else's problem um, and gives the state more power to deny permits in the future to developers who've, um, who are out of compliance with these rules. Um, so we were really proud here the, uh, of this and we think that this is gonna help the situation on Main Lakes. The last sort of lake protection bill that we worked on is about wake boats. You guys know what wake boats are? Um, all the cool kids now, apparently these days, uh, are doing this thing called wake surfing. So there are these boats that are heavier than normal boats. And what they do when they're heavier is make extra big waves, extra big wake out the back. Um, and you can surf, you can have a, you know, you're not even tied to a rope. You can just have a surfboard and surf behind it. It's kind of cool, not gonna lie. but um, what it does is um, hurts the, the lakeshore habitats on the sides, especially our loons, right? We care a lot about loons. Loons are evolved to be very good swimmers, but they're terrible at walking. And so they can't like walk up high on a bank to make their nest. They can't fly to a tree to make a nest. They have to make their nest basically right at the shoreline, which means that they're really susceptible to waves crashing over. We lose, we lose loon nests all the time from boat wake, right? So um, there is a boat wake law in the state of Maine, um, but we were finding that these wake boats, their extra big waves were, were, were overpowering the, the restriction. And so we worked to address it. And this was a lot of difficult negotiations for chess. You know, the boating industry does not want to do anything about this. 
Um, and so she had to work, you know, really with different industries and with the state to try to find some solutions here. Um, they came up with them. So um, there are these wake boats now, as per the law, um, need to um, uh, keep their actions more than 300 feet out from shore and in water more than 15 feet deep. Um, which is pretty good. There's a lot of education we'll need to do to make sure people comply with that. Uh, but getting that on the books to begin with is a really big step. Um, so that's lakes. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Wabanaki studies and sovereignty issues. Um, so Maine Audubon is heavily involved with partners working on um, Wabanaki sovereignty issues in Maine. The Wabanaki tribes in Maine, um, Wabanaki nations uh, are not recognized as sovereign tribes, unlike every other tribe in the, in the nation, basically. Um, and um, they don't want that to continue. Uh, and we stand behind them uh, um, in uh, wanting the state to recognize their sovereignty. Uh, it's a very difficult issue in the state. Um, and the, the main sovereignty law that has been uh, passed or, or is advancing is not quite as strong as they'd like it to be or has been in the past, um, but uh, it involves a lot of issues, a lot of which that are sort of out of Maine Audubon's purview, uh, but it is advancing a little bit. Um, we also passed uh, 1642, which Maine passed a law 20 years ago or so to require the teaching of Wabanaki studies in schools. But we were finding that it wasn't really being followed at all. And so these things weren't happening. And so we helped support um, this bill to um, update Wabanaki studies and further encourage uh, the required um, use in schools. So I don't know as much about this as Chess does, unfortunately, um, but um, she was really proud to work on these issues for us. Um, some of these are a little wonkier. I'm not going to lie. Um, if, if you didn't think it was wonky yet, I thought it was all fun yet. Um, you know, part of what we need to do is make sure that state government works efficiently and effectively. You know, we can pass all the laws we want, but if they're not being enforced, then then what's the point? Um, oops, again, I do that. Um, and so, um, one of the things we we want to do is make sure that the envi the environmental agencies in the state, in this case, the uh, state's DEP, um, felt that they had the tools they needed to actually uh, enforce laws and, and uh, punish bad actors. Uh, and so we passed this bill 2058 um, that uh, gave them some more tools to, um, to, to either turn down permits or uh, issue stop work orders for uh, activities that were going on in contrary to uh, environmental law, to existing laws. Um, and so um, the DEP was really pleased to get this power. You know, it's really frustrating to, to, for them to have identified what the environmental choice is or identify what's in concert with the law and then have people either ignore it or uh, act under other authority. And so now the DEP has uh, some more authority to do the right thing, um, which is really good. Not yet, this, as far as I know, not yet. Um, the way it works, and I, I don't know where the slide is about it, but once a bill is passed, it, it goes into effect 90 days later. And so some of these bills have only been in effect for a few months. Um, I don't know if, if there are examples of this one being enforced yet, but I know um, just the sort of knowledge among bad actors that this is now a, a power of the DEP is a real asset to them um, because you know it requires people to be in line. So I'm not sure if it is act, uh, it's worked under this statute or just the sort of the idea of it being out there has changed behavior, um, but both of those are possible. Um, so a couple more here. Um, working on endangered species, Maine Audubon, in addition to loons, has had a long, decades-long prog uh, program to protect beach nesting birds. Um, beaches in Maine are, uh, are unusual in terms of the ownership rights and the access uh, laws. Um, people, uh, the state owns down to the low water mark generally, um, and um, there's a lot of private property on beaches, unlike in a lot of other states. Um, there are companies that come in and want to harvest uh, rockweed. Um, rockweed is seaweed that's used for a variety of different products. Um, it's just the stuff, if you've been to the beach, you can see it growing, you know, right there attached to the rocks. 
there are sort of mechanical harvesting um, companies that come in and, and want to harvest that. Um, because of the sort of uh, legal gray area of the uh, harvesting area, uh, and because of the sort of um, environmental impact of that harvesting along the, the coast, it's something that's very controversial in a lot of areas. Um, and so there was a bill that from the industry back bill that would allow it much easier for the industry to come and harvest rockweed um, that we and many of our partners opposed and we stopped it from passing. So that's good. Um, and um, the, the coastal sand dunes one is a little bit of a niche one. Um, every few decades, the state updates its coastal sand dunes uh, map. Um, that's a, uh, a map that's showing very delicate habitats, very rare habitats in Maine, these coastal sand dunes. We don't have very many of them. Um, and uh, there's this process where the state develops a new map, but then you have to go through a process of actually getting it adopted, which sometimes doesn't happen. Uh, but it did happen this time. So now the state has officially some new maps to look at. Um, plastic pollution. So over the past few years, Maine has done a lot of good in the world of plastic pollution. Um, we are uh, banning single-use plastic bags, increasing recycling wherever we can. Um, we passed, the, I think, the nation's first, um, uh, I'm blanking on the term, um, it's requiring uh, producers to pay for the cost of their packaging down the line. Um, so to make sure that companies are, uh, are responsible for the products once they leave their hands. Um, recycling is a tough issue. And um, believe it or not, you can probably believe it. You know, there are some unscrupulous companies out there. Companies will, will just put the old triangle recycle symbol on products, even if they're not recycled. Um, that that sort of stamping is really poorly regulated and um, taken advantage of by companies that just want to feel like they are doing the right thing. Uh, and so um, this issue sort of came to light in a big way early uh, earlier this year, and we are working on um, solutions to it legislatively. Um, what we did in this bill here was to um, uh, allow the DEP to start investigating and figure out um, you know, which products were being mislabeled or misleadingly labeled in Maine um, and, uh, you know, get a better handle on the exact situation and also start to explore ways to incentivize people to be labeled correctly. Um, it's not something that Maine has complete control over um, in terms of where these products are coming from. They're not produced in Maine largely, um, but we want to make sure that everything that is sold in Maine with those arrows on it is actually recyclable in the right way. Um, so we, we got a lot done, um, but we didn't get everything done. Um, oh man, and I want to actually, I'm gonna, um, hold on for a second. I'm gonna get rid of this and then find the, the other program because I had some other slides that I wanted to do. I'm sorry about this, I, I opened the wrong one. I was so proud of myself for getting all the tech going Let's see if this is any better. Yeah, okay. Um, oops. Remember this? All right. Just quickly, look, no, nothing like a nice slide full of text, huh? Great. Just quickly, I did want to say, because this is helpful to remember, how does a bill, how does a bill work, right? It starts with an idea either a legislator comes to us or more often we work with legislators say, hey, here's an idea of a bill you should pass. And they'll say, okay. Then we draft it. We work uh, you know, amongst ourselves or with the state offices to actually draft the text of the bill, figure out where it will fit into existing state law, jump through those hurdles. We, the bill is introduced and goes to a committee. I mentioned those committees earlier. Um, and um, then there's action in the committee. This is where we are most involved uh, and sort of getting a bill passed. Um, we go and testify, we, we lobby the, the um, people on the committee. Um, at the end of the day, they have a vote and they either vote whether this bill in front of them uh, ought to pass in front of the full legislature or ought not to pass. And that's a really important vote. Uh, the committee votes, it goes to general order, it passes there, then it goes to the governor's signature. That's how a bill passes. There are a few more steps in there, but that's the gist. So I wanted to cover that. 
scenario for this again. Ding, dong, ding, dong, 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 dong. Okay. Okay. We did it. Ding, dong, dong. Okay. All right. Um, challenges. So it was, uh, we didn't get everything we quite wanted. Um, a lot of this came down to the budget. And this is where, I, you know, Chess is much more knowledgeable about this very wonky budgeting process at the end of the day. Um, you know, I was talking about at dinner. It, it's much easier to get a bill passed than to get the initiative funded. That's part of it. You know, passing a bill that says, that's aspirational, says we want to do something, is if the language in that bill costs money, then it's, then it's a big hurdle, right? Things that cost money are very hard to do, especially if you haven't identified a new source of money that would pay for it. And so um, there were certain bills that we passed that we weren't able to fund at the end of the day. This happens in every legislature um, and it's sort of part of the process. Um, at the very end, like the last day or two of the legislature, um, all these bills that don't have dedicated funding go into a big list like that. And basically everybody fights over them. Basically, you know, it's all these negotiations about, um, you know, what um, surplus budget money the, the governor has that may be able to go to these specific funds. And it's really hard because there's lots of great stuff in there, our issues and other issues around the state. Um, some of that here uh, didn't go our way. So um, some bills about other aspects of smart growth, um, uh, a, for, a main forest advisory council um, that we passed didn't end up getting funded, even though it was very little money. Um, the Wabanaki Studies Advisory Council also didn't have money. Um, certain tree growth tax uh, credits that we, we supported um, didn't get uh, funding. And then about $2 million that we wanted to fund programs more directly on aquatic invasive species, we just couldn't find, couldn't find the money at the end of the day. Um, so that was a real challenge. Chess was up for like a week straight fighting these battles and trying to negotiate. Um, and we got a lot of things, uh, but everyone sort of came out uh, with some things they didn't get. So we'll be back at it. Um, making sure I'm good on time. I just want to do this too. You know, we focused on state advocacy during this presentation. Um, I was pleased in 2023 to pass the statewide bill on um, bird glass collisions. What that does is uh, I'm creating uh, voluntary guidelines. So the state will, will uh, you know, take a look at these guidelines and see whether they want to incorporate them or not. That's all part of the negotiation. Um, but my other goal on policy for bird safe stuff was a municipal ordinance. So if you go around the country, um, most of the policies that address bird glass collisions are, are in cities and they're municipal ordinances. Um, there's about 20 or so cities around the country that have an ordinance. I wanted one in Portland. Um, I spent four years uh, with, with teams of volunteers monitoring the city to, to prove that this was a problem in the city of Portland. We, we proved everything we set out to do. We found tons of birds. We found them more often against buildings with a ton of glass. And then we worked with architectural and design partners to develop an ordinance over in 2022, 2023. And then we uh, worked with the city to get them to support it and they supported it. And then we uh, went in front of the city council just a couple of months ago and they passed our ordinance. So um, Portland is now the first city in New England that has a bird safe architecture ordinance. Um, this is gonna require, so it's not voluntary, require buildings uh, over 10,000 square feet, which is most of them, to use bird safe materials. That means a lot of things, but bird safe materials. And so that's me uh, right after the vote, my fist raised, pumped up. I didn't know, we didn't know how it was gonna go, but we passed. And so most of our stuff is state-based, but we do do some city ordinance as well. And I wanna make sure that that got a shout out in there. Um, this is some of my great volunteers there, including representatives from the Portland Society for Architecture, who's an important partner of ours and the University of Southern Maine. All right, looking ahead, just wanna quickly talk about uh, what's coming up. So uh, Maine Audubon is preparing for the first session of the 132nd legislature starting in 2025, early 2025. Uh, now is the process where we sort of look around and say, what do we wanna do right now? What are the options? Uh, we're talking with partners, we're talking with legislatures and uh, legislators and figuring out where we wanna go. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is lighting standards lighting standards. So um, uh, lighting standards are important for a number of ways. It's involved with the bird glass collision issue. We know that lights um, can attract birds in mostly to eat the insects that are attracted to lights. 
And so if you reduce light pollution, you reduce the number of birds that are brought closer to windows. Um, also, it's just nicer to have dark skies, right? And we all know the benefits of that. So um, we worked with the process. Uh, uh, so the state is working to update their own um, guidance. Maine Audubon this summer, Chess um, and some of our interns did a lot of work to, uh, to supply our comments on those recommendations. Um, but we are looking at legislative aids to help, once they're finalized, help municipalities adopt them. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is not formed yet, so we don't necessarily know what the states, what the towns will need or what we can offer them, but we are looking at ways to uh, allow states to adopt these uh, more readily. So we're excited about that. Um, more shoreland zoning stuff. Again, this is not well set up yet. Um, because it's still uh, up in the air, but there are still some lingering issues with shoreland zoning and making sure that um, people follow the law there. And so this is still at the top of Chess's list to, to take action on. Here's a controversial one. Um, cats are an issue. Cats are an issue. Um, we love cats. Everybody loves cats. Many, many people at Maine Auburn have cats. Um, Cats are proven time and again to be a very effective predator of birds when they are outside. Um, this is a very difficult issue. Uh, we, we owe it to our mission to work to protect birds and, and other wildlife um, from, from cats and other predators. Um, but we know how difficult it can be to uh, encourage cat owners to take action or, or do other things. You know, we, we um, and so what we are doing is working to understand the landscape of policy options here. Uh, for example, Maine does not have, you don't have to register your cat in Maine. Um, uh, things like that. A lot of things that happen for dogs don't happen for cats. Uh, and so we're looking at the landscape of cat related policies out there um, and are gonna evaluate and see what might work, what could work, what won't work, things like that. So, um, you know, we owe it to ourselves to keep this on our list of issues. Um, but um, it's a challenging one, one we hear about a lot from, from both sides, really. Um, finally, land conservation. Um, you know, land conservation is, you know, essential to who we are. Um, Maine has a formal recommendation of 30 by 30, if you heard of 30 by 30. So a lot of folks out there, scientists say that, um, um, in th we want to protecting 30% of your land, conserving 30% of your land is the best way to sort of inure ourselves against climate change and you know keep biodiversity up. Um, we Maine is not at 30% conserved right now, um, um, but we're working to get there. Um, there's a lot to that problem of how we conserve additional land, how do we fund it, um, how do we identify the lands, how do we purchase them, um, but those are all issues that we you know, are working on with, with greater focus this legislative session, um, but we have always been working on really as part of our mission. Um, finally, I just did wanna say that we are growing. Um, Maine Audubon has a really good uh, reputation in Augusta. We are really well known around the state for our environmental advocacy, but it's really just me and Chess. I mean, it's two people, it's crazy. And we regularly work with partners who have um, double digit numbers of staffers working on advocacy issues. And so we're hiring. We just hired a, a young lady named Anya Wright. Um, she is an absolute superstar in this field. She's like early 20s um, and she's um, already served on the Cl Maine Climate Council. Um, she works, we stole her away from Sierra Club um, and she's gonna be starting next month. Um, so we're really excited about that. She's gonna be taking over some of our renewable energy portfolios and, and some of our other climate change related portfolios um, as she gets started taking some of the weight off me, which is great. Uh, and we're excited to have her. So that's all. Um, this is our update. There are some things you can do. Um, you see if you subscribe to our action alert system, this is how we can reach out to you and let you know that there's an important vote coming up. Um, that is super important because like I said, these legislators are, all, are sometimes hearing from one or two people. Um, you can follow us on social media uh, and email us if you have any questions. And that's all. Speaking of questions, I have time for questions if anybody wants some. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure, absolutely. I mean, there have been lots of studies shown about the impacts of, of light on uh, different creatures. Birds sing at different times. Um, they are awake longer hours um, and they don't have the sort of darkness that they need. It gives predators better opportunities to see them, to see birds and other animals. So it aids things like raccoons and foxes on their, on their hunts. Um, there's a lot of impacts from light pollution that we are just sort of working to understand. Um, that's on the ground, but also it can impact, of course, migratory birds flying over as they are, you know, um, you know, it's crazy to think about being a migratory bird, uh, you know, 200 years ago, and you're flying over a completely dark continent, and now it's lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that type of shielding. Yeah. That is certainly one of the fundamental recommendations of our comments is shielding light. You, you know, you don't need light to go up. Keeping light where it's needed is a fun it's fundamental to sort of good environmental practices. Um, whether or not it'll be required or incentivized or something else is needs to be negotiated and figured out. Um, but that's the goal is to keep light where it's needed and not where it's not needed. Nancy. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the bird safe window that we have most of us have seen in the past in China? Yeah. Um, and all sorts of stuff has sort of been happening as far as that window is I received an email from someone in California wanting to send me some glass, mm-hmm. which is now supposed to be not safe. Mm-hmm. I, I did not order it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, you know, sure. what does the homeowner do that's most effective? Yeah. I guess there's a lot of It's a great question. There are lots of things you can do. Um, the anything fundamentally anything that lets a bird know that there's a window there and not the sky they think they're flying into or the habitat they think they're flying into anything that lets a bird know that this is a solid surface is a bird safe solution and so that could be any number of things insect screens are like the number one they're completely safe they make windows completely safe so if you have a window with one of those screens on the outside perfectly safe um from there, there's any number of different solutions. There are uh, strings that you can hang on the outside of the window. One of the things in, which makes it a little difficult is that the treatments need to be on the outside of the window. Because if because what we're worried about here is a reflection, right? So the window reflects the sky or reflects habitat. So birds think that they're flying into those things. And so if you have, if you, for example, pull up a, a, a Venetian blind on the inside of the window, the reflective, dangerous reflective is still, it's still out there. And so you need to address the outside surface of the window to have it be effective. But there's all kinds of solutions. There are strings you can hang on the outside. There are decals you can put out there. There's paint you can use. Um, there is um, glass itself that has ultraviolet strips in them um, or other um, ceramic fritz put on them. Um, there are landscape things that we are still sort of working to understand. So for example, the library out here that has that, uh, which I've received reports of dead birds from before, has, a, has what we call pass-through glass. So if you have gl- a window here and a window here, a, a bird looks through that and sees a tree on the other side of it and thinks they're flying through and hits, hits the window there. And so avoiding features like that, if that's something on your home, um, is really important. And so, there are tons of different solutions. Uh, the fundamental one that we recommend is we, we use these feather friendly decals at home, which you put this a pattern of dots uh, on the window that work great and they don't upset the view and they can be placed on, you know, a lot of homeowners have a certain window that's a problem in their home. Um, we, we recommend focusing starting there 
uh, and that, that goes a long way. So, is there a connection to the data? For example, you know, when you put a decal on in the middle of every neon sign, that's local. Yeah, it kind of is. There, so there's a certain range of yeah. The scientists who study this recommend a two by two or two by four pattern, two inch by four inch. Um, the reason is birds are very comfortable flying through small areas, right? So if you're a little warbler, you're used to diving into a tree or something. And so if you have a big window with a decal up here, birds will just fly to the other area if they think that that's vegetation. And so um, getting extensive coverage on the window really has been proven scientifically to increase the chances that a bird will see it. Um, and so a lot of the products, you know, the decals that you put on your windows come in, you know, strips of, of gridded dots, basically, and there's lots of different patterns or whatever, but um, it really is getting coverage uh, quite extensively. How much does that impact the You'd be really surprised. I, I mean, your eye, when you're looking out the window, your eye looks at the thing you're looking at. It doesn't look at these little dots. And so um, they are... Uh, colored specifically to sort of help you not see them. And so we have them on our windows at Gilson and you don't, you don't notice them. You can, look for, you can look at them and look for them and you can notice them. And from the outside, they're noticeable, but you know, you don't, you're not looking, you're not worried about looking inside and you want them to be noticeable on the outside because that's how the birds notice them. But from the inside, it really, uh, you, you, it blends in and you, you avoid it quickly. Um, so if you are down at Gills and Farm sometime, we are treating our windows with all the different products that we can think of um, to show people sort of what, um, what's available and take a look and see, see how you think. So that you're talking about, you're talking about bigger. Right? Yeah. Are these, I'm just curious, are these windows that are now being made that are tall or something? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different ways they can do it. And one of the reasons that we wanted an ordinance is because it's much cheaper and easier for a, a builder to design their building to be bird safe than it is to come in and retrofit an all glass building. And so our, our ordinance and like any others in the country does not address uh, existing buildings because it's simply too expensive and difficult to come in and require that. That's just the reality of it. It's new construction. Um, and when you are starting with new construction, there's lots of things you can do. You can just use smaller windows, for example. So one of the really interesting things about our route in Portland is that we pass both new buildings that are like all glass, and then a lot of the sort of classic buildings uh, that are mostly stone or have windows that are separated by mullions or have other tactics. We almost like never find, literally never find birds against those older buildings with smaller windows and only find them against the large glass panels. And so fundamentally, you can just avoid building that all glass building. It's the same price. It's not any more expensive. You're using the same techniques that, you know, bricks or whatever, um, but you are making it bird safe, even if it doesn't use fancy bird safe products. Um, because those things at this point are, are quite expensive. And, you know, ultraviolet glass, for example, is much more expensive than um, regular glass. And so we're sympathetic. We want to encourage people to think about it early so they can avoid those costs up front. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. 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 It's pretty crazy. Um, it's really fun, actually. Uh, I, I started this work in 2012 in Washington, D.C. when I lived there. And that was the thing. And that was really before the science was well known. Uh, we would walk this specific route at like 5 a.m. in the city and look for birds. And then we try to figure out what is it about this building? Is it the lights? Is it the glass? The glass, mostly. But you'd be out there and you'd be seeing you know, unsavory people of the night walking around all the time and all kinds of crazy stuff happening. It was really, it's really pretty fun. And we do that in Portland. And so I'm scheduled to go tomorrow morning. I don't think I, I don't know, I'm kind of tired. Um, but uh, we have this host of 40 or 50 volunteers that are walking through Portland every single morning looking for birds. Um, and we find them. We've, we found four this morning on the route. Um, 
uh, we, you know, campuses are a great, a great place for this kind of advocacy because there's people who are concerned about birds around and there's sometimes, you know, a willingness to take action. Um, so there are any number of things you could do here. Monitoring I found is always getting proof of bird deaths is a great advocacy tool because it's one thing to just say, look, the science, I, I know that this glass window kills birds because the science tells me to expect it. It's another thing to say, here are all of the dead birds I found at this window. Um, that's sort of, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of success. We've worked with buildings, um, L.L. Bean headquarters in Freeport, the Memick building in downtown Portland, who, who were not obligated to act, but who spent tens of thousands of dollars to address, to retrofit, because we showed them all the pictures of the dead birds back there. Um, and so that, that works really well. And so monitoring, um, uh, picking a couple buildings on campus, I could look through my records. I've there. Um, um, what's his name? Jackson, the professor. Evan. That's it. Um, he submitted records over the years. Some other people have. So I know Evan will know the hotspots uh, on campus. So monitoring them, and then you know that that um, library entrance way. That's a really easy fix, um, and wouldn't take very long. So um, any number of places could. That'd be a really great strategy. Um, the, the thing actually that, you know, if you're talking about a, um, a, a program or a, a, a study project is looking into the seasonality of bird strikes. In Portland, birds really only strike during migration because that's the only time they're in the city. In the summer, there are just, they're not birds, you know, they're not warblers in Portland. Um, and in the winter, there are not warblers in Portland. Some of the strikes that I've got from UMF have been um, finches who come to winter winterberry or other uh, trees that bear fruits in the winter and then uh, fly and strike windows from there. I, I can't, I, dro I drove through UMF last winter and there was like a thousand bohemian waxwings in town. Um, those birds as they fly encounter, encounter windows. And so in away from really ur big urban areas, um, this, is a, this is a breeding bird problem and a winter bird problem as much as it is a, um, uh, a migratory bird problem, but most all of the studies are urban studies. Uh, most all the studies out there focus on urban areas. That's where all the attention is, um, because that's where it just has been. And so I think there's a lot of uh, exploration to be done on the seasonality of bird strikes and how to address that from a, a policy end. Um, so just an idea. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You know, it's it's our honor. You know, we're we're here to, to do this, is what we want to do. Um, it's a lot of work, but you know, we uh, thank God have really good have good foundations both with partner groups around the state and organizationally. You know we're really well supported with you know the foundations for the work, why we're doing this, and then with the, you know the other departments terms of getting the word out. So you know we're a really good organization, um, and uh, it takes a lot of work. And I'm glad that Chess <laughs> does most of it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'll just tell this quickly. Uh, when I, I started in 2019, um, you know, when you start a job, uh, I'm from Maine. I came back to Maine uh, and worked for Maine Audubon. You know, when you start a job, like the first couple of days, they don't really have stuff for you. You're sort of signing paperwork and sitting around. I was doing that at Maine Audubon and I started, I looked up the law that creates the state bird in Maine. I said, what is the law? And all it says is the state bird shall be the chickadee. That's the entire law that was passed. And I said, I said, oh, that's kind of weird because you know there are two chickadees in Maine: Oriole chickadee, black cat chickadee. What? What? That's weird. And then a couple weeks later, I was talking to a reporter from the Press Herald, and we were trapped on a boat together. And I was trying to make small talk, and I happened to mention, like, do you know, like this thing about the state bird I found? And she was like, what? And I said, oh man, that's no, that's not good. 
Um, and then like a week later, I was on the front page of the Press Herald. It's like Maine Audubon says there's no state bird like this. And all my colleagues are like, what are you doing? This is, this is not a thing. What are you doing? Um, a representative from Skowhegan saw that article and then wrote a bill that's to clarify the situation. Uh, and so there was this bill in Congress in, in Augusta. I got dragged up there to testify in front of this committee about what the state bird should be. It was a really interesting look at the politics of state birds because there was this uh, guy from a coastal district where boreal chickadee does not live. And he said, are you asking me to take away a state bird from my constituents in my coastal town? And I said, I, I guess so. So there's like politics involved in it. Um, the whole thing was just silly. The committee voted ought not to pass. They said, let's don't do anything. Um, and we sort of slunk away from there. Um, and so, no, there is no movement to clarify the situation. But it is true that there is no state bird, official state bird in Maine. It's a family, not a uh, species. If you go to Massachusetts, their law says the black cap chickadee with the scientific name. Ours just says chickadee. So I'll leave it up to you. So, all right. Well, thanks so much for coming. Great to see you all. Thank Thanks, man. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you. Um, let me know anytime if you have questions or if you're looking into bird safe yeah. stuff or anything else. Well, let's just go bird. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 
It's almost amazing. Like I never see. You know, I I, I luck into them uh, at Evergreen. In May, in the next yeah. year. Yeah, Franklin County for the summer. I have. The summer, I have. 